Sage Dynamics. This week we're going to talk about skills and techniques for weapon mounted lights on rifles. Don't you move. Do not move. So what we're going to talk about in this video is some particular uh, difficulties, advantages and disadvantages, so to speak, that we have with a weapon mounted light on a rifle versus on a handgun. Uh, we all know the handgun is more maneuverable than a rifle. A uh, rifle, in order to point it somewhere, we either have to shoulder it or fire it from the hip. And obviously firing from the hip is a kind of a bad thing, depending on the situation, because we can't bring the sights to our eyes, uh, which is something we want to do. So there are some maneuverability issues, some navigation issues, so to speak, with the, the light on the rifle. But as I'm going to show you, you can still use a rifle mounted light just as effectively for navigation and illumination and control as you can with a handgun. Now, the first concern we're going to have, obviously, with a dedicated light on a rifle system, be it a shotgun or preferably an AR-15, uh, be it occupationally if you're using it for home defense, is just like with handgun weapon mounted lights, the light is married to the weapon system. So wherever the rifle goes, wherever the rifle is pointing, that's where a light is pointing. So the same concerns present if I'm using it in a home defense situation, there might be some, there's probably people in your home you don't want to muzzle unless you live alone. You have to be very aware of the fact that wherever you're putting the hot spot of that beam is where the barrel itself is pointing. So what can you do to illuminate a room and not muzzle people in that general visual area? Well, just like with a handgun, we can illuminate the ceiling and umbrella lighting, or we can light up the baseboards. Me personally, unless there's a reason not to, I'm going to use an umbrella lighting, sort of like a modified high port, just so I'm able to illuminate more of the room. Now, if there's someone who needs a gun pointed at them, it's very easy to then transition to that position as you're coming out of like a modified high port. If you're going to use a baseboard lighting, it's no different than being at a low ready and coming up on target. The advantage to this is I can illuminate more of the room. I'm not coned in on just where that beam is, and it allows me to point the muzzle in a safer direction. Um, than keeping it in my visual horizon. Now, people talk about backsplash. Is backsplash going to be a concern? Backsplash is always a concern. This is a 500 lumen scout light. If for some reason I point it right here at this wall and stare at it, it's going to ruin my, it's going to backsplash and cause me to have vision issues. The smart thing to do is to not do that. You're a thinking animal. You know when you're getting too close to an object. If you're closing in on a wall as you're searching, Bring the beam down or bring the beam up. Now you don't have to worry about backsplashing yourself. In most situations, for certain people, depending on what you're going to use your rifle for, especially in a home defense situation, you know your floor plan. So there should be no reason at all that you ever backsplash yourself. You know how deep your rooms are. You know how long your rooms are. You know where mirrors, TV screens, things of that nature are. So there should be no reason whatsoever, barring some kind of unforeseen exigent circumstance, you'd ever have to worry about backsplashing. Because you know how to manipulate the light inside your environment. Now, occupationally, if you're moving into floor plans you're not familiar with, the concern is there, which is why we want to be able to use the rifle light in a smart fashion. Illuminate here, illuminate here, that way we get a raw light, and if something needs us to, hop, to put the hot spot on it, we simply bring the rifle to shoulder, assume a good shooting position, and go from there. Now, whatever the situation, whatever the intent, I'm using my weapon. If I confront a threat, 
if I perceive a known or an unknown threat, there are some certain concerns I'm going to have. The main one is I want to remove that person's visual horizon, which means just like with the handgun, just like with the handheld light, I'm going to put that beam of light in their face. My natural desire, natural tendency, the, the less experience and training I have with low light procedures is I'm going to bring that bring, I'm going to want to bring the beam down and focus it on their chest. That just seems to be a natural tendency that a lot of people have. We want to maintain that beam in their face, but that also means if we shoot, that's where our first rounds are probably going to go. Now, distance dependent. Uh, the further away they are, the harder it's going to be to even maintain light control on them. Because if they've got a really good degree of square footage between you and them, the light is going to lose its effectiveness as you get further and further away. But let's say I have confronted a threat in close quarters, like a home defense situation. So, whoa, drop knife, drop knife, drop knife. Now, my natural desire might be to go to his chest. When I go to his chest, he regains some of his ability to see me. If I maintain the beam on the face, that's where I'm probably going to have to shoot if I'm given any reason to shoot or if I decide to shoot if I'm based on the situation. Now, because I'm aiming at the head, is there a point of aim, point of impact difference on rifle systems? Know your zero, know the common distances in your home, and find a place where you're able to practice shooting at those distances under low light situations. Now, obviously, the more realistic, the better, but if you think about the distance from me to him, if I'm low, I'm still hitting the head. If I'm high, I might be throwing rounds over where I want to hit, even though I'm maintaining light control on the face. So, if I'm using cover or concealment, uh, if you live in an average residential home, most of your walls, doorways, things that way, they're not covered, they're going to be concealment. But I'm using this, this, this object right here. Let's say, for the sake of argument, it's covered. Uh, I don't want to backsplash myself. I don't want to put myself in a situation where I bounce light off of that object and illuminate to be my threat. I want to push my light past the cover. So I want to come all the way in, but I also don't want to telegraph. I don't want to stick my barrel into a room because if the bad guy's right here, you could get the potential situation where now you're fighting over the gun. Uh, that's definitely a possibility. So it's kind of a delicate balance between pushing your light past the cover object and keeping your weapon out of a room that you haven't visually been able to check. Yet. Now, if I've pied this doorway before I brace off this cover, that's one thing. But if I'm using something, an object, strictly as cover to negative a threat, okay, I know a threat's here. If I know a threat's in that direction, I can't be as concerned with the potential for another threat to be here because that's my known. I have to focus on the known before I can start to worry about unknowns. Because if I start worrying about unknowns, the known is going to get me, so to speak. Uh, with the rifle, light's dedicated to the rifle. What does that mean? If I'm using the right side exposure and I'm right-handed, I'm good to go. If I'm using a left side exposure, and the rifle light is where the rifle light is, I now have to transition the rifle to my other shoulder to expose le le less of me to the threat. So, with the right side exposure, not that bad. Now, if you think about a left side exposure, let's take a look at that. So now, for whatever reason, um, I'm forced to use a left side exposure. Uh, this is what I have available to me. I need to put the light on the outside leading edge of my body, if possible. If I'm using, like this is a scout light, it's mounted on the right side of the rifle. And this is one of the reasons why I strongly recommend you either 6 or 12 o'clock mount your light like we've already talked about. But it's unavoidable in this situation. This is the light configuration I have. Maybe it's a light system issue uh, for law enforcement and military. I, I don't have a choice. This is what I have to use. So ideally, I want to transition the rifle to my left shoulder if I have time to do so. There's two ways to do that which we'll go over, but I'll show you what it looks like when you don't do it versus when you do it. So. If I keep it on my right shoulder, this is what I get. I'm going to backsplash myself a little bit. I may actually have to lean out a little bit further and become a little less stable in order to engage my threat. Now, if I make a shoulder transition, it's not nearly as drastic and I'm able to maintain a more stable stance as I come around that corner to engage my threat. The right shoulder, I'm going to lean out a lot further and become a lot less stable. Left shoulder, just like that. Now, just general navigating, I'm looking for a threat, I'm looking for a bump on a knife, whatever my motivation is for having the rifle and moving to engage a threat. Home defense situation, occupational, whatever it is, navigation is dependent on where I'm able to place the light source, when I'm able to place it there, and how it may benefit me or create a negative. Uh, just for sake, the biggest problem you're going to have is navigating thresholds, pine doors and things like that. We don't want to telegraph our location 
as much as we can. So going constant on is going to be situationally dependent. I don't recommend it. I like more of a strobe or a light when you need it. Uh, the camera can't really pick it up. But if I turn this light off, I don't actually need the light. There's enough ambient light in this room that I'm able to see what I'm looking for. Obviously, if I'm looking for a very small object, like say I dropped my phone or a pin or something, I need the light. But to see people, I don't need it. Now, to get a positive ID on the threat, I would use the weapon light. But just for general navigation's sake, I don't need it. I'm not going to use light when I don't need to use light because it does telegraph and announce my location. So for the sake of instruction, let's say there is no ambient light in this room and the weapon light is lost. I can illuminate off the baseboards, or I can go high and illuminate off the ceiling. Puts the gun in my peripheral vision, that's definitely a drawback, but it's something I'm willing to deal with if it gives me more data and I'm thinking about the problem. Baseboard illumination, you pie doors just the same way. Uh, obviously, why you're there, when you're there, and what you're there for is going to motivate how fast you do it. But if I'm actually searching for someone versus I'm already in contact with the threat, I have all the time in the world to pie this door. I'm in no rush. If I'm in a rush, I'd obviously go faster. I'm going to move around, and I'm only going to shine, shine a light in that room when I need to. I want to keep my entire field of vision clear. I keep the weapon low, keep the light low, in order to see what I want to see. And I only use the light when I need the light. Now at this point, I've seen most of the room. I've got a far corner, and I've got a corner over here. I've got two corners I haven't seen into. Which one do I go for? It doesn't actually matter. It's really a personal decision. Me, personally, I'm going to go for the long corner because there's more data down there I haven't seen than the short corner. But I have to hit them both at the same time, or as close to it as possible. It's physically impossible for me to see both corners at the same time, so I have to make a decision. Me, like I said, me personally, based just on my life experience, I'm going for the long corner than the short corner. Because my threat is more likely, from my experience, to be further down than he is in the short corner right here. Alright, so I pied my doorway down and I come through. One thing I see people do wrong all the time is how they actually move into the room. Now there's technically no wrong way to do it, at least that's what they say, but there's a lot of wrong ways you can come through this door. There's a lot of better ways to do it. As I make entry into the room, I have to check these corners. I have to pick which one I want to check first. I already talked about it. I want to check this long corner first. There's more room in that direction than there is in this direction. So my eyes are going there first. But do I come through the corner on the gun? Is this how I'm going to do it? No, absolutely not. There's no reason for me to shoulder the weapon unless I have someone I need to shoot at. Because it takes zero time to do that. So as I make entry into the room, I'm kind of going to do it. I'll be pinning from here because this is the last place I stop. And as I enter, I'm just going to look. If there's a reason to point the gun in any direction, I will do that. Get out of the doorway as quick as I can. There's really no tactical ninja etiquette to that. It's literally just entering a door as efficiently as possible in a direction you want to go. Some people like to come in low, that's fine. Me personally, I'm going to come in in a fully erect position. If there's a reason that I need to go low, I will. Um, if you're entering a room you've never been in in your life, there could be furniture concerns that you haven't seen yet, situation issues like that. So it's definitely something that you might have to confront entering the room. So, no tactical ninja etiquette needed. Just walk into the room as efficiently as possible, get out of the doorway, the so-called fatal funnel, as quickly as possible. Now we talk about the configuration of the rifle. I've got two different general setups. These are two setups I prefer. Uh, this particular one, we've got the Surefire Scout. I've got a mid-mounted pressure pad. That's where I want it, so if I have to switch from hand to hand, or if I'm, ro if I'm handing the rifle's controls completely over to the left side or the right side of my body, my activation controls are still mid-mounted. The rifle light is mounted off of the 12 o'clock, which I don't really prefer, but if I want 500 lumens in this configuration, or if this is the light I'm issued, that's the kind of light I have to use. Whatever the situation is, I'm able to deal with it. Um, whatever takes priority. If you notice, my iron sights are moved back because the light control to me takes my priority because I can't use any of my sighting systems if I can't see. Uh, so, order of importance, the sights get moved back. They are backup sights. If for some reason my main optic goes down, I'll have to use those, worst case scenario. Uh, the other configuration I have is a Surefire X300U. Uh, that's actually my preferred rifle light. Uh, it's 500 lumens. I wish they'd make them brighter, but in good time. And if you'll notice, I have a shroud guard on this system. The reason I use this Unity XO is so I don't negligently or accidentally, depending on which vernacular you want to use, activate the light. I, I have to purposely put my finger placement in there to actually activate the light source. It's not going to bump into my gear if the rifle's slung or anything like that and turn itself on. 
Not a concern you have as much with pressure pads, but with this kind of lighting system, uh, the shroud guard, the one that Unity makes, and I think that another company makes one as well, makes a whole lot of sense. This one, obviously I've got a switch on either side of the rifle so it can be operated. Now, some people might want to take talk rifle length. Uh, this is a 14.5 pin, brings it to the full uh, civilian legal 16 inches without NFA. This is a 10, 10 and a half inch, which means you have to have a tax stamp uh, for your lower to use this system. Some states, not allowed. Which rifle makes more sense for close quarters or, or home defense use? Uh, I'm gonna say both of them based on the techniques and the skills you use with them. The difference in length, as you can see, is not super significant. Does it matter? Absolutely it matters, especially if you're gonna run suppressed. But just for general purposes, you can do just as much maneuvering with the longer rifle as you can with the short one based on the techniques that you use. All right, so we've taken a very, very basic look at uh, light techniques for rifle. Is there more to it? Absolutely. I can't put everything in one video. Now, there isn't hours and hours and hours and hours of different techniques, but there is a really good strict basic toolbox which allows you to address multiple situations. Uh, this video is in no means all exhaustive, it hasn't covered every topic, but I think I covered enough of literally, just like the title, the basics, to give you an idea of where your skill set's at and what you need to know additional to that, or maybe some validation for the techniques that you're already inherently using. Uh, but again, just like with uh, any low light system, I strongly recommend that you seek out a verified instructor, someone who's got a really good reputation when it comes to low light techniques, and take some training with them actually get behind the rifle in a class. In a low light class, the more realistic the better. Force on force is priceless. Uh, if you gotta do a live fire class, I suggest doing both actually. Uh, but get an idea of what it's like to run the rifle, be a shotgun or an AR uh, in a low light situation. The better your ability to defend yourself and your loved ones. Uh, whatever your purpose for the rifle is, be it home defense, perimeter defense, occupational use, uh, the light is going to be valuable because it's just not practical to use a handheld light and a rifle. You can if you have to, but it's not something I would prefer to do. I would rather transition to a handgun light than I'd rather, if my light on my rifle went down, bring another light out. It all depends on the situation. Uh, one of the topics that keeps coming up is rifle reach. The rifle obviously shoots further than the handgun, so we want more light on the rifle, right? Because it, it extends our envelope, our, our available envelope to shoot. How much light do you need on the rifle? The answer is exactly the same as I've said about the handgun, as much light as possible. Uh, if a handgun has less range, and I have a 1,000 lumen or 2,000 lumen light on it, in the daytime, there is no light limitation, so my own common sense dictates how far away I'm willing to shoot. At night, it's no different. Even if my light touches a potential threat, that distance alone may prevent me from shooting. So there's no reason to get wrapped around the idea that, like, well, I don't want as much light because I don't want to shoot that far. If you can't shoot that far, you won't shoot that far anyway, hopefully. So in the rifle, it's basically the same story. If you have a rifle light that reaches out to 500 meters, and if you do, let me know what you got. Uh, but if, say you have that, 500 meters, does that mean you're actually going to engage a threat that far away? You want to be able to, but common sense dictates. Common sense dictates. Just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Uh, so again, just like the handgun, have as much light as possible and use it responsibly. I'm Aaron Cowan, Stage Dynamics, training for Ha, 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 ha.